feeding the humans if possible. And, and automatically with the program generation system. And, um, and that's it's very difficult, of course. And what we did is we, we worked on a very restricted domain. Okay, very, very restricted. And then the question is, if you go to a very restricted domain, is it possible to understand this optimization process so well that you can formalize it, put it into a computer, and let the computer do it? Okay? And, uh, and we have worked on this for, for, for many times. Maybe we are the first one to introduce DSL-based optimizations to uh, DSLs to performance optimization in the early 2000s. Uh, this work is called Spiral, and over the years we built many generators. Here are two that I will not talk about. Here's a generator for Viterbi decoder. Um, you just set what kind of code you're interested in, and you click a button, you wait, and you get this crazy looking code that is very fast. So that's a very popular generator, actually. All major communication companies uh, have access to this site, so we keep track of this. Here's another one. This is Fourier transform. This is what we're going to continue to work about. Here you specify some things that you want. You generate and you get very log in this case. Okay. And ignore this website, meaning stay with me in the lecture. And, and if you're interested in this, look at this later. Okay. So don't. Look, you can play around with this on the website. And in both cases, you get very good code. Very good code. Okay. So what's the possible approach? And this goes along what the kind of the vision or the high-level idea that I painted on Monday. Uh, we have to somehow get into this high abstraction level to do the things automatically that typically a human would do. Okay? So that's what I, how I painted it on Monday. And so in particular we have to capture algorithm knowledge. We have to somehow get algorithm knowledge into the computer and DSLs seem a very uh, natural and good approach for this. Then we have to do the structural optimization Remember what I showed with these two parallel FFTs, right? I mean, how do you get from one to the other? You need the domain knowledge, so you have this already. And um, it's a structural optimization. Once you have the proper DSL, you can use a rewriting system to symbolically manipulate. You need the high-performance code style, this ugly-looking SSA-style code. But if you have a generator, you can decide yourself what kind of code you want to output. And then you have always choices, and that's a, that's a big problem. Um, you never know which among hundreds and thousands of reasonable choices is the best. And uh, many people use search, and this is called auto-tuning, right? You have like thousand choices, produce them all, measure the runtime, pick the fastest. That's nice. Um, it's a very engineering approach. Um, I, I like a bit better to use machine learning for this problem, but, but search is also reasonable. So you have to handle choices. Okay, and uh, so this is what we, what we set out. And um, here's the team. So this was back when I was still with Carnegie Mellon. We started to work on this in the late 90s, together with other um, well-known auto-tuning efforts, like uh, maybe some of you know this was Atlas, FFTW, and, um, and Sparsity or Bebop from, from, from Berkeley. So here's the team. We were all a bit younger back then. Um, but uh, the nice thing was was a multidisciplinary team. So compiler people, if you're in compilers, maybe you know David Padua, Jose Mora, signal processing, James Ho, computer architecture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, and what I'm going to, to do now, I'm going to explain to you a little bit uh, Spiral, uh, the program generator Spiral, and uh, touch on the most important parts. And it gets a little bit mathematical, but I hope. I get the main ideas across. So if you, if you think it's too much formalism, then don't get discouraged because when we come to the hands-on part, it will be very restricted and uh, it will be more about how you do something like this in a very, very simple form with a particular uh, language framework. Yes. And what do we do if we don't think it's too much formalism but we think it's too little? Then uh, come talk to me and I, have, uh, I can give you much, much more. Okay. okay. So, um, so, so Spiral uh, tackles the domain of linear transforms. Okay, that's the domain, very restricted domain, linear transforms. What is a linear transform? It is a function that has an input vector of length n, and it produces an output vector of length n. And what it does is it multiplies by a fixed matrix, a fixed, a constant n by n matrix with numbers in it. It's a base change. That's what it is. 
the base changed mathematically speaking. Okay? And the most famous function in this category is the Fourier transform, the base change. And it's given, it's specified by this matrix. Okay, so these are all what you see here, these are all complex numbers. They sit all on the unit circle. And it's a matrix that has no zero entries, right? So it's a dense matrix. So computing a Fourier transform means taking as input a vector, multiplying it by this matrix, and you get the output vector. Okay? Okay, so if you do this by definition, it takes uh, theta n square ops. Uh, but it turns out this transform has fast algorithms, as all of you have at least heard, uh, and you can do it in n log n asymptotically. Okay? And in fact, most transforms that are in use, in use, many in signal processing, they have n log n algorithms. Whereas it is known that for it, in, in the generic case, this is an n square, has n square complexity. Okay, so let's look at an example to understand this a little bit better. Um, so here, let's first look on the left side of the equation. So x here is a vector of length 4, okay? x0 to x3. And we want to compute a Fourier transform of size 4. What you have to do is you multiply by this matrix, okay? So this matrix I showed before for size 4 looks like this. And you see it has 1s and minus 1s, and then here i and minus i. So question, if I do this by definition, as it is written here, how many additions and multiplications do I need? So how many additions? Pardon me? No, exactly, exactly. This is a very, you can just count. 12, exactly, it's 12, right? For every row you have three additions. Three, for every row you have a reduction in a sense, right? So it's 12. And then the multiplications by 1 don't count, by minus 1 also don't count, becomes a subtraction. And if I count the ones with i and minus i, I get 4. Now, of course, the complex arithmetic is really done in real arithmetic, but let's say, let's not worry about this. This is the number, the x is typically a complex vector, so you have 12 complex adds, 4 complex multiples in this case, okay? So that's the op count. Now, the, the FFT, in fact, there are many different FFTs, this is one, the most famous one, can be written as a factorization of this matrix into a product of four matrices. And here are the four matrices. And we still want to multiply to this vector. Okay, and now what I can do is, instead of doing the computation in one shot, I do it in four steps, meaning I take my vector, first I multiply by this matrix. How many ops? Zero, right? Zero, it's just a permutation matrix, right? Then I get a new vector, I multiply by this, I get a new vector. So how many ops to multiply by this? Zero multiplies. Zero multiplies and adds? Four, four exactly, four adds. So you see how the game works, then I get a new vector, I multiply by this, one mult. Get a new vector, multiply by this, four adds. Now you can add up and you see, oh yeah, it's a bit cheaper. And that works also asymptotically if done in the right way, and it gives, this gives n log n, and this is n squared. Okay? So this is the FFT. So, so the FFT is a factor, can be viewed as a factorization of the transform matrix. Okay? Any questions so far? All clear? All basic math, yes? How do you obtain this decomposition? How do I obtain this? Yeah. That's non-trivial. <laughs> <laughs> That's a typical professor answer, right? So, no, um, um, so the, it was first discovered by playing around, okay? And the person who discovered it first is actually Gauss. Gauss, you find it in his collected works, right? And, um, and later on, around the 70s, people figured out that you can derive it using uh, proper uses of group theory. Okay, so it's not, it's not a crystal clear thing how, how to get there. Okay, so um, another way of representing the same thing is a data flow graph. Okay, you see, and I write the data flow graph from right to left, unusual, but this is because also here things flow from right to left. Okay, so here's the vector x. You see first there's a permutation, right? And then you see you have two smaller blocks, and these are actually Fourier transforms of size 2. 
And because of the, the way the computation works, they're also called butterflies. Then you have a scaling, where actually these scaling factors are trivial. And then again, you have two DFT2s. If you look a little bit like it, you see there is a DFT2 where it gets the first and the third input. Okay? Good. And you can express the same using matrix algebra um, in this form here. And you see that here is the DFT4 matrix. Here we have four factors. And this L is just a symbol for this particular type of permutation. This T is a symbol for this diagonal matrix. And what you have here is this Kronecker product of matrices. Okay, and what, yeah? I in the top represented in the bottom. And uh, so let me define. I wanted to do this anyway, because then also Georg. Can. So, so this is the one little bit I would like you really to understand. So this is the Kronecker or tensor product of matrices, okay, something you find in a linear algebra book. We didn't invent it. It goes like this. If you form it of two matrices, what you do is you take every entry of the left, of the left matrix and you multiply it by the right matrix. Okay, so A is AKL. Okay. Can, you can visualize this actually very well. And now you can do this game with the identity matrix, right? So if you have an IN tensor B, so everybody in their head imagine an identity matrix. Okay, we have it. Now multiply every entry by a matrix B. And imagine how the thing looks, and you realize it looks like this. Right? Now we do it the opposite way around. This is a bit, tiny bit more messy. We, we imagine a random matrix. That's very easy. Rand, mud, whatever. And you multiply every entry by an identity matrix. And then you realize you get a matrix with some stripy structure. Right? So it's both are sparse matrices. Okay? And uh, also we want to memorize that DFT2 is 1, 1, 1, minus 1. Now you can understand what's going on here. You see this has the form I2 tensor DFT2, right? And this has the stripey structure, DFT2 tensor I2. Okay, it's very neat. It's, uh, and the reason that you have such a nice structure, that is deep rooted in group theory. Okay, but we are happy with this. There's structure, it's not just some sparse matrices. And T42 stands for this diagonal one one exactly. I. Exactly, because if you go to other sizes, you always have a diagonal matrix here, and there are two parameters that control it. And since it's always diagonal, it doesn't, it's actually not too much trouble anyway to, to work with. Okay, so we have this, and now what we did is we said, great, we have this matrix formalism. Let's just make this our DSL, matrix expressions with linear algebra operators. And then we went out. In fact, it was me, the postdoc back then, and the one who had the math background. I went into the signal processing literature and I went through many hundred papers and I extracted all the fast algorithms that were in these papers and put them into this form, which usually they weren't. Okay, and then here is a subset. And what you see here is that all these transforms, for example, here is the one you, uh, one, uh, one second, this is the one used in JPEG this is used in MPEG, and, and this is used in MP3 decoding, and so forth. You see here the generic version of what we had before, and you see it has the same shape, but you see that the DFTs here, they have still larger sizes. So n factors into k times m, and then here you have k and m, meaning these have to be expanded further. Okay, yes? You get this right immediately, or when was the last time you found a mistake in this table? No, I didn't get it right immediately. What I learned is when uh, an expression exceeds a certain length, and the length is maybe this, I don't trust myself at all. And then you use a computer algebra system, and in fact, I mean, within Spiral, we, we could then also really not verify, but validate for many, uh, verify for fixed sizes, and then you, you trust. Yeah, but you don't get this right, no. How long did it take to assemble this table? I did this on the side, like, 
Um, this, including all the others, I, I don't know, it was like a two year, because in parallel I did algorithm research, so this fit quite well. And as I learned more, I put, put them in. Because yeah, this is the power of formalism, and why some of us want to see more formulas, <laughs> is because you can summarize two years of work in one page. Absolutely. It takes two years to read yeah. <laughs> and in fact, <laughs> and it's more than two years of work because the people who wrote these, uh, so here, 100 journal papers roughly, the people who wrote the 100 journal papers, they did a lot of work, right? And that the summary of this is exactly this. Yes. Okay, so that's nice. You see, all of these are recursive algorithms written in this formalism. Good. Now we have a great formalism to describe algorithms, but somehow we have this gap. There's the math and we want code. How do we get from the math to the code? And it turns out this is very simple because all these constructs, which remember, we want to multiply these matrices to a vector, right? And there is a very simple interpretation. So for example, if there's a product, remember before we had four factors, if I multiply to a vector, first I multiply the vector by the first and then by the second, right? And, um, and so forth. So in essence, you create the expression tree, and then you write a, can write a simple template-based compiler that, that uh, traverses, uh, that descends the tree and generates the code. And I want to here, for example, multiplying by a diagonal matrix is very simple, right? You take the vector and you multiply it. You take the vector, multiply it by the constant values of the diagonal. So you see, it's, there's no magic there. I want to pinpoint this, another very simple one, i tensor a, right, remember? There's a B, of course, but same thing. If you multiply this to a vector, you see you can write this as loop code. Right? There's a loop that takes chunks of the input, applies A, for which you get code recursively, and gets chunks of the output. Right? What does the notation of the two colons mean? Um, this here, oh, this is MATLAB style notation. And if you write it, if you write N colon M, it's a range. And if you have an element in between, it's a stride. So meaning you go from here to here at stride one, stride one, but sometimes you have a higher stride. So it's MATLAB's, okay. MATLAB's style. OK, so you can actually, this very easy exercise, and then you can write quickly a compiler, and this gives you reasonable C code. But of course, it has done, you have done nothing of all the things I talked about before. OK, so how does the whole system work? This, you have seen this before without any explanations on Monday. Um, so, one part of the system works like this. Let's say you want to have a function for a Fourier transform of a fixed size, 8. Then you say, give me code for size 8, meaning you click the button, right? Give only size 8 as an input. Then Spiral looks up the rule database and finds rules that match. Then it will recursively expand it into an algorithm, applying in essence the rules I showed before. And you get an expression in this formalism. Note that there are choices, because when you recurse every step, there are choices. Then we have this algorithm expressed. We go to another representation that I didn't explain. Uh, you can forget this for now. And you, go, you can imagine taking the compiler from the previous slide and going from here to here. And you have a program generator for transform. It's already kind of neat and useful. But again, this is the straightforward code, not the good code. And now, what I explained already on Monday, the crucial part, the crucial insight, and really back then actually a surprise to, to most people that, that have seen that work, that you can overcome compiler limitations, those that I mentioned before, by doing the difficult things here at the high abstraction level. In particular, these two forms of parallelization, or other forms as well, you can do at the high level through rewriting. And uh, locality optimization, you can actually do at this level, and then, you know, the code level, I mean, getting the right code style, and you can do more things down here to make sure that you don't do everything. Um, you leave as little as possible to the compiler. Because when you do it, you know it happened. Yes? I mean, could you explain people's code style means here? Because it probably doesn't mean the usual thing, right? Because it's not about readability or anything like that. Right? So no, the code, this is what I said before. Remember, for example, turning it into SSA-style code. Okay. Right? That really you do some unrolling in a clever way, and you, do, you turn it into SSA style, meaning you, when you access arrays, you load in scalar variables, then you do all the computation of those. This is a code style thing, because as a normal person would not write this code like this, right? This is really high performance code style. 
And then you have choices, you can do search or learning. Okay? Good. Now, now we understand, you see, just at a very high level, you understand how to build a program generator for all these transforms. So it's actually not really all that difficult. And the nice thing is the math helps. The math helps because it allows you to concisely express all the algorithm knowledge. So that's already neat. But now the question is, what, what about these things? How does that work? And let me give you a glimpse on parallelism. So we want to take these mathematical expressions and turn them into parallel code. The first thing we have to do is we have to understand, is there a nice connection that we can exploit? And as you already have guessed probably from the examples, Indeed, there is a connection, and the most obvious one is this. If you have a construct like this, it is naturally parallel. Okay? It's embarrassingly parallel. There's absolutely no problem parallelizing this. So, for example, if you have four processors, and here P is four, you have four parallel computation, it's perfectly load balanced, no problem. You can just generate parallel code using threading, open MP, whatever it will work, give you perfect speed up. Unfortunately, you saw the formulas before, they're really messy. It doesn't look all like this, otherwise it would be done already. Um, in particular, there are these access patterns. But now we come back to this false sharing example. There are other constructs that are good, and these are permutation or data access constructs. So P here is a permutation matrix, and I assume a cache block size that holds two doubles, mu, mu doubles here too, then these are the good access patterns, because if you look at the definition, take a permutation matrix, multiply every element with an identity, what you get is a permutation of blocks, like here. You see, there's a permutation that always permutes blocks of size 2. And you want the blocks to be the size of the cache block. OK, that's good. Then you avoid false sharing, because at any given time, a thread owns an entire cache block. Never two threads access the same. And the neat thing is you have expressed it in math. And now you can, it's very simple, you take a formula, you would like to have only those constructs, so what you do is you rewrite the whole thing so that everything ideally that doesn't look like this afterwards looks like that. And then you have efficiently parallelized at the math level. And this is how this may look in practice. It's automatic and it's done in Spire. So what happens is you say, give me a Fourier transform of some size. And now you have to provide two microarchitectural parameters. In this case, the number of cores or, or threads that you want to use and the cache block size in doubles if you want code on doubles. Two parameters. And the rewriting uses this information. So first you have one expansion using the algorithm. And then before you expand these smaller DFTs further, you rewrite based on these tags. And there's a rewriting system that has a lengthy set of rules that are mathematically correct. And in the end, you get this horrendously looking expression. Uh, but it's not so bad, actually, because you can look at it and understand it at the high level. So if I look at it, you see that. Here is a recursive call to a DFT, but you see there's an IP tensor. So this is actually neatly parallelized because of this IP tensor. No matter what I do to this DFT, no matter how I expand this further. So you still keep your choices. The same here, there's the other DFT. And all the rest here is more or less are access patterns. But look at these access patterns. One is IP tensor. This is a parallel access pattern. There's no problem. And look at these. They're all tensor IMU. So it's actually neat that this is at all possible, right? And it turns out with minor variation, you can play the same game for all these transforms. And effectively, this rewriting does approximately what I hinted at before. It takes this and completely restructures the entire thing into something of this form. And then you can design a rewriting system for every platform paradigm, as we like to call it. For SIMD vector instructions, you need a different rewriting. And for distributed memory, a different rewriting. If you want to go to FPGA, it's a different rewriting. Yes? The load balancing comes from this IP tensor. Yeah, that I understand. Right. But for instance, if you want no false sharing on this part, you have to introduce some constraints for the load. If you want no false sharing on this part. Yes. Um, 
but this by itself has absolutely no problem because you access, you, you have, right? So the problems are on the X. Oh, sorry. So, so the question was, um, how do I know that there is no false sharing here, right? And, uh, and in fact, I mean, you have a point there because it's, um, here I assume uh, sizes that are powers of two. And that means here you are perfectly load balanced, but the size of this thing is a power of two. So you will, again, you will work on more than one, but entire cache blocks. Okay? Okay, so here are just uh, sketched, unreadable, all these rewriting systems that we designed, and, and it's work, but you know, you only do this once. You see vectorization, it is informed by the vector length new. Okay? Um, so if you want AVX, then you choose maybe four for doubles. If it's SSC, you choose two, and then the restructuring is different. Anyway, so it's a rigorous way of, of, of doing this. Okay, 20 minutes. Um, okay, let me, let me give this a try, because somehow I never get to explain this. So this is, uh, this is another. This was maybe the biggest challenge we had to solve. If you just understand a glimpse of it, then I'm, I'm already happy. Um, so um, I just want to get the power of rewriting and math across, really. Um, so what I showed you before is an approach that generates code for Fourier transforms of a fixed size. Right? The size was fixed, and then you apply your algorithm, you rewrite, it's parallelized, vectorized, and it's very fast. Um, now, if you look at a library like FFTW, that's not exactly the interface they provide. They give a library for general size, so n is an input parameter. So it's a completely different kind of code. It has, it's recursive, right? It's a recursive code, and you don't know how it recurses because the input size is only provided um, when the library is used. So it's a different beast. Actually, in many cases, this is, uh, not in all, of course, but in many cases, this is the better approach because this code is huge and this code is smaller. So if, in particular, in signal processing, usually you know the size, right? If you, for example, in wireless communication, you need like four or five sizes of FFTs, and then it's efficient to generate special code. For many other applications, you want a general library. So you have to generate recursive code and, uh, and that was really the toughest part. And let me show you, so, so then uh, one of my students, Yevgen, he, he cracked the problem. How do, you, how do you, in essence, generate recursive code for general input size? So let me give you a glimpse how this works. So here's the ge generic version of, of the Fourier transform. It's recursive. It's one particular FFT called Kulituki FFT. And for a specific case, it looks like this. So this is size 16, and you choose K and M to be 4. So you see there's this permutation, looks a bit more complicated than before. You have four DFTs of size four that are again computed in some way. You have a scaling and then again four DFTs of size four. Good. Now how did FFTW, for example, implement this thing? Um, if you look at this, you think, oh, this is very easy. It's four steps, right? I have my input vector. First I permute. Then I call recursively four DFTs of a smaller size. Afterwards, I scale, and then I call four DFTs of smaller size. Four steps. It turns out this is bad, because you make four passes through the data, and that gives you bad locality. And you can do better, and it looks something like this. And if you look at the code, you have to choose the radix. Let's not worry about this. But you see here there are only two loops, so two steps, not four. Okay, and, and in essence, these steps were fused, and you know, this is not really magic, but it's, it's actually, you would be able to figure this out very quickly, to, to do only two passes through the data, and you, you improve locality, meaning less, fewer cache misses. And that's very simple. In essence, what you do is, instead of doing the permutation, you compute the DFTs, but you, you, you use a DFT function that can handle these access patterns. Okay, so you do it through access rather than through permutation. And the same here, rather than doing all the scaling as a separate step, you fuse it, and when you do this DFT, before you just scale with the necessary factor. So it's just one pass through the data. Okay. Everybody's still with me, more or less? Sorry, yeah. Can I ask a very, very yeah. question, but if you 
can make DMTs for not so large cases. You just enroll all the loops. Right? That, that's right. Um, and then the, the first step is not a step because you rename variables, right? You don't. If you unroll, then these things disappear anyway, yeah, okay. right? But unrolling makes sense for Fourier transform maybe up to size 16 or 32 if you vectorize maybe 64. Why so the reason, hmm? Why not larger? Because the, the code size uh, gets too large and you run into cache. Is this oh, a, how actually, does it get at 32? It's actually, what I'm saying here is an empirical statement because we tried it out. How far can you go with the unrolling? And clearly you only need a recursive library if you go to large sizes. For small sizes, clearly, you unroll the whole thing, and then all these problems go away. This is really for large sizes. OK, so, but what you see is that in order to accommodate this, you need to have four functions with an extended interface. OK, because now this DFT has to handle strided access, and then this DFT has to handle prescaling. Right? So it's an expanded interface to do this in two steps. Is that clear? OK, and now we, are, we have a program generator. How do I discover this automatically? And that really puzzled us for a long time. How do I, how do I discover that I need this interface? Because I started with this more natural looking one. Okay. And for that, we, uh, we introduced this, this other language, uh, Sigma SPL. It's again a matrix language. and I. Given the time, I just, again, want to give it the idea. I'm happy to explain in all details offline. Um, I explain by example. Um, let's take this construct, right? Let's assume my transform is just this, like that. In Sigma SPL, it looks like this here. So you see that somehow I see the loop here. This is a sum. It's actually a matrix sum. And these are gather and scatter objects. So visually speaking, the gathers explain how I read from the vector, and the scatter explain how I write into the output vector. So as I go through the loop, right, the gathers read from different parts of x and write into different parts of y. And the neat thing is, this is still a matrix formalism. right? So if you think, what, what does a gather look like? What does a gather look like that reads from a vector of length 8, the first two elements? Well, it looks like this. Right, and here I have a vector of length 8. See, if I multiply by this matrix, I get the first two elements. Right? So these are all still matrices, and the sum is actually a matrix sum. Okay, so it's still matrices, meaning we have math available to do stuff. Okay, so it makes loops more explicit. And you can think also of the gathers and scatters as containers for these index functions, how something is accessed. Okay, now. Now with this formalism, I can discover or I can perform this fusion. And it goes like this. So you start with the DFT. First you apply the qli tukey FFT recursion one step. Okay, as we have seen before, it looks like this. So what are these curly braces? The curly brace says you are a function. So in the beginning we say we want a DFT function and if you recurse, you assume that these will be function calls. Now we translate to sigma SPL, and what happens is the L is just stays as is. It's written like this, where this is now really the permutation as a function, not as a matrix. The diagonal here becomes a diag, and this F is really the function that specifies the entries of the diagonal. And you see these two Kronecker products, they become sums. Right? You gather something from the input vector, DFT is still assumed to be a function, and you scatter. So it's the same. Thing I showed before. And now comes the one innocent looking step, but that does all the magic. I again use a rewriting system. The gather is an access. The permutation is also describes access. And both are have functions, so you can just compose them and then simplify them, and you get actually a new single gather. And here the diagonal has a function, and the gather also has a function. You can just compose them. Right, as functions. And then you get this. Now that doesn't look like much, but what you do now is you expand the curly braces, braces all the way out and you make this functions. And it turns out that the math is such that these per this here, these expressions specify exactly 
what we saw on the previous slide. It, they specify the interfaces they need. So as you see, I need these extra parameters somehow. And now I, I have new functions with an expanded interface, and I also need them com to compute them recursively. So I take now this, throw it on the top, and do the same thing again. And maybe I discover some new function prototype, maybe not. So I repeat this until closure, until hopefully I have a set of functions that call each other recursively and that are complete. So you see, it gets a bit more intricate, but if you look at FFTW, which is a very nice library, then you see just how intricate it gets. I wonder whether there are 10 people on the planet who understand FFTW to 80%. Okay? Anyway, so, um, so you do this until closure. So now if you apply this to our previous example, you get a call graph, meaning a set of recursive functions that call each other. And it turns out that uh, three or so are sufficient. So in fact, you don't get really anything new. Okay? Three or four are sufficient. Okay. Um, but you saw the rewriting before that we did for parallelization and for vectorization. And you saw how complicated these expressions got. So now you do this combine this rewriting for parallelization with this rewriting and you may imagine that hell breaks loose. And that's exactly what is happening. So then the full-fledged thing looks like this. These are the functions. They are no much smaller and you get maybe in this case, 10 to 15 DFT variants that call each other recursively to do this fusion together with parallelization and vectorization. And that's the moment when you start wondering whether a human being can do this at all, right? Not just efficiently here, the tool, but can a human being do this at all? Um, okay, and then you have the problem solved. So, so then you have can generate a dozens maybe 100 FFTWs, FFTWs in the thesis. For every transform, you play this game. Depending what algorithms you feed, you get different libraries, recursive libraries. And here's just a table, all these transforms. And then uh, the paralyzed versions tend to become quite large in code size. Um, and you can do that. OK, anyway, it was just a glimpse. If you just got a little bit, I think it's already worth it. But it's a neat thing. And, and I wonder how one can generalize this in other domains. I would be happy to discuss this if you have any ideas on that. OK, and the thing works. So here's a benchmark, maybe not the most recent anymore, on Sandy Bridge. But here you see there are fierce competitors, Intel libraries and FFTW. And, um, and, and, and it's quite competitive. It's an automated approach. And um, remember that uh, with Spiral, you put in a bunch of rules. You get out a big library. It's big because of what Christoph said. For small sizes, you unroll. Um, you need to generate all these unrolled pieces as well. And that's why the code gets large. And there's a performance plot. And uh, it's as good as handwritten code, even better sometimes. Uh, I'm sorry. So FFTW yeah. is this MIT library that's handwritten, right? Or yeah. Is it also FFTW is like this. The base cases that you need, these unrolled for sizes uh, 2, 3, 4, 5, until whatever, they are generated. The infrastructure that sits on top and orchestrates and calls them, that is written by hand. So, so this, ha this generated stuff is done with an old version of your stuff, or they had their own thing to, to do that? No, no, they wrote, I come to this related. So they wrote a Kotler generator. There's a paper from 99, PLDI, really nice. Uh, a really nice piece of work. They explain how they generate the base cases. And what I just showed you is how do you derive the infrastructure automatically. Now, FFTW, they did it for FFTs, but because you formalize it, you can apply it to like 20 transforms. Right? So, you, and you get other benefits. Yes? The goal in FFTW is you have a single library that mm. takes as a parameter at runtime the size. Yeah. And, and for most purposes, you'd know the size and you wouldn't use this at all. You'd use your other simpler thing. That's right. And the libraries that we generate here, like this library, is like FFTW. It's one library and it's adaptive, meaning you run it on a computer. And depending on the computer, actually, because it has also a search built in, so it's, from, from a user perspective, similar to FFTW. Whereas the ones I showed before, specific size is, of course, a different animal. And how much faster do you get if you know the specific size? That's a good question. Um, I can only give you an empirical answer because, of course, we tried this. I would say 
I would say 10 to 25 percent. Okay, that should be roughly accurate because you can do some optimizations that you cannot do otherwise by specializing too. Yes? Just a quick question for these huge sample sizes. Uh, did you consider generating code for some other targets like GPUs or I don't know whether you're doing that? So this is for Sandy Bridge basically. Yeah. We did some work on GPU. It was briefly on one slide before. Um, <coughs> We got reasonably close to what uh, the CUDA library, but uh, somehow we had always bad luck with students in this case. A student left and joined a company to build airplanes, and then somehow CUDA was very good, and then we retargeted to other things. But we did FPGAs, for example. But yeah, clearly GPUs are, are important in this business. What we did was, on the large side, we generated code for a Blue Gene P running on all 128,000 nodes. So it was MPI plus OpenMP plus the specific vector instructions on BlueGene. And uh, that was at some supercomputing conference on one of these productivity awards. So we went large, but GPU, we, we didn't do as thorough as we would have liked to do. Uh, can you explain the local minimum at uh, roughly one k? The local minimum at roughly one k. Yeah, that's a good answer. So a good question, sorry. Um, so what you do is, so see, here, up to here, uh, the library calls specialized code. Okay, so this goes up to 256, that's unrolled code. 256 is large, but since it's vectorized for AVX, actually the code shrinks a lot. And here come the first recursive calls, and they create always a bit of overhead complete, compared to completely unrolled. And from that point on, luckily, then parallelization suddenly starts to pay off, which here it doesn't. The search finds that, and that's why it goes up again. But it look, may look different if you go to a different... That, that's, 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 that means we've got like, you know, several points going down, just one jump and then it goes up again. Why, why is like several points, uh, why is uh, whatever, 512 uh, lower and then 1k even lower? Um, well, it's wouldn't I have like a big shrink and then recursion, you know, goes, goes in or So the recursion is here, this is the first recursive code. Why is the next one even worse? It's, uh, it's, remember the word, this is performance, right? So the, it's efficiency, right? So the efficiency is a little bit, I mean, why is it not the same? I don't know. I mean, it's, the difference is really small. I mean, this is, uh, I, I can only qualitatively argue, here come recursive calls, here parallelism, here cache issues cut, cut, cut. Right. Yeah, but it may look very, you go to a Haswell, it, it, the picture may reshape in, in some ways. You never know, yeah. That this stairs, I think this platform has a level three, and uh, and and somehow the last level cache sits roughly here, yeah, uh, and then, it, yeah, yeah the right, so. yeah, and then the working set, you the yeah. But so the, the L1 and L2 caches are not that visible, or are they? Maybe around not that visible. Okay. Access very fast. Yeah. Yeah, because um, on Sandy Bridge, uh, access to the L3 and L1 is the same speed. L2 and L1. L1 and 2 L3. You can all access them at the same speed. Oh, okay. I know that L1 and L2. So, so this, this, yeah, L1, L2 access is very fast. There were earlier, on earlier platforms, you see more steps for the caches. But, but uh, yeah, same throughput. Same throughput. Yeah, latency is different. Yes. They have different latencies, right? So, um, so yeah, one can argue a lot. I mean, if one can understand something at all in these performance plots, it's already a good thing, okay? Um, anyway, so, so yeah, I, I have to shut. So of course, we, to just generate FFTW is boring. We generated others for other sizes, but then all generating all the specialized codes were useful. So at one point, we generate for Intel like some 4,000 functions um, that, that cover many architectures, many transforms, and code was very fast, so they were happy. So it is really a, a real world application, okay? So now, what do you do next? Well, we have now an ongoing work. Daniele is here. Where's Daniele? If you're interested in linear algebra, so we are developing a spiral-like system for linear algebra um, that also works very fast. So here's some generated code. Here are competitors. It works. Sometimes it's really good. Sometimes it's competitive. Um, so this is ongoing work. Same, same formalism, that's interesting. So let's see how far we can get there. 
And to wrap up, this leads over to, to Georg. Um, when I moved to Switzerland, I wanted to do more research in this direction. And, you know, I'm not a programming language person. And what I learned from this 10 years experience is the biggest impediment to progress was the platform. Because it was a little bit hand built inside a computer algebra system. And then you want to expand it and you get people. And they have to learn this long standard programming language and build something. And, and then you realize this is very hard. And so I started asking knowledgeable people that I could get, hand, could get my hands on, are there any platforms to, to support something like Spiral? And then I learned there is a few. And in this workshop, actually, you get an overview. So then we picked one of them, um, this case LMS, what you heard, uh, what you heard already inside Scala, and, um, and implemented a small Spiral prototype. And, and Georg will explain a little bit in this direction. And, and just to connect to what Tiag showed you, right? So here is a little example with a Scala function. And then you can put your wraps in different places. If you put the wraps around the doubles, you get a DAG like this and code it like that. And if you put the wrap around the array, you get a different DAG. And then when you unparse, you get code like this, which is actually the kind of code style that we like for performance. And then if you also put a wrap around the range, you get a different DAG and you get loop code. And I was completely excited by this. Depending where you put the wrap, you get different code styles. And Georg will explain to you more about this. I found this very useful. Uh, our previous system definitely didn't have this ability. So, so staging, I mean, this you have no, right? But uh, one benefit or one thing we learned from this experience was that you can, by, by, uh, by, by, by choosing different staging decisions, you get different code styles. And it was kind of useful. Okay, and then you can write a generic version that can, can be a function that computes the, the transform or that generates code that is unrolled or that generates code that is looped. Um, and, and there were other benefits. There's some related work here. Um, I, I chose here to mention some efforts that you haven't heard of in, in, this, uh, in this workshop so much. If you're interested in this general area, here are some interesting efforts. They all come from the domain of performance people, not from the programming language side. So it's really interesting for programming language people to, to look into this. Here's the Kotlet generator that, that I mentioned before. It's a 99 work. Flame is very interesting for linear algebra. This is for optimization algorithm and so forth. I mentioned auto-tuning efforts that do search. And then environments. Well, this workshop gives you a really great overview. In fact, you're really lucky to, to see, like, in one week, you see the different ways of, of building DSLs and program generators in, in a rigorous, efficient way. You are close combat in the linear algebra space was called MTW, something like that. That's not here. What, so what is that? Uh, which, uh, which, sorry? Uh, you close combat in the linear algebra space in the slide that you had just, just before. Oh, MKL. Oh, MKL. That's a handwritten interlibrary. It's the math kernel oh, library in Intel. No, 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 no. MK, this is handwritten code by actually Russian programmers that write off an assembly code. Infinity, many Russian programmers. Not in infinity, <laughs> but like uh, 50 to 100. We met them actually, and, and so we collaborated for a while. Very good people, actually, really. These are guru programmers. Anyway, so to wrap up, um, what I've showed you is a, is a program generator. It's DSL based. The domain is very small. But then the benefit is you have a lot of domain knowledge and you can go all the way to the fastest code possible maybe, even though we have of course no proof. And what I like about the work conceptually is in essence it is about going from math to fast code. Now the nice thing why I like math is besides being a mathematician originally, is that math comes with its own DSL, right? Mathematicians have thought over many decades and centuries how to write their math in a proper way. So that means whenever you deal with math, there's already a way of writing it. And I like the idea of taking this way of writing it and then studying how do you get from there in a, in a sequence of rigorous steps to very fast code. And if you do this also, you demystify a little bit this business of performance optimization by making it rigorous rather than, you know, like this guru thing that, that nobody really understands. Okay? Of course, this is like high level talking, right? And uh, the question is, um, how to put this to practice. But at least for transforms it works, DSLs, rewriting, search and learning, which I didn't talk about. And um, we are interested in new domains. We work really now with, with more, with better language platforms, which I'm very excited about that they exist. 
and um, if there's much more work in all kinds of directions uh, on, the, on this website. Good. Yes? So is there ever any structure in the vector that you apply the uh, uh, transform to that you can exploit? Or have you ever done that? Any what? Sorry? Is there ever any structure in the vector that you apply your linear transform to that you can exploit? Or maybe approximations that you want to do? You mean structure in the input? The input, yes. So in the, in the application... It's specialized for somehow. Like Yes, so what happened is, uh, so of course we, we have looked into this because if you have a generator, then uh, these things are great. Special, you love specialization. And it turns out that for the FFT space, the only thing I have seen is oh. that you have situations where you know that part of your input is zero. Okay. And then you can do, if this is structured, meaning three quarters are zero, that happens, then you can do actually that code elimination on the formula. And we have done this. And, but other in, in, in most application cases, you don't know anything about the input. So, so this is not, in that sense, also makes the space much easier. If there's an input dependency, also on performance, then, then you have to use different techniques. So it's, it's an easy domain in that respect. Any other questions? Yes? The decision making here refers to the decision between different transforms? Or the, the decision between different for example, algorithms for the same transform. Rem remember that when I recurse, there was a degree of freedom. Yeah. If I have size 16, it can be 2 times 8 or 4 times 4. And also, there's a few different recursions. So when you do this recursively, it spans the space of choices. And there's more choices down the stream, right? When you do a bit unrolling, it's a question how much and so forth. And you can do a search, but we have also done machine learning. That you, in essence, do a search on a few cases, then you learn extrapolate, put this into the library, and then it becomes deterministic. That's also an interesting direction, actually, that I like. Yes? Um, how long does it run if you want to generate the whole library for a specific? So if, if I download it, how long? The whole library is these FFTWs. There's actually no search in there, because the search ability is, is inside the generated library. You just generate the infrastructure and all the base cases um, between 30 and 60 minutes. If you generate an FFT for a fixed size, where in essence you do the search while you generate, then for large sizes it can be longer. But it's never longer than one night, which was always my kind of benchmark. You're always <laughs> willing to wait one night. Like leaving in the evening, the morning you have the code, I mean, who can complain about that? Right? <laughs> yes? So earlier in the talk you said you mentioned that you have the most popular transform, uh, but there are others, right? And so uh, which other ones do you use? You saw maybe in this was in an earlier slide, so going back with you, over animated. So in um, here you see what we did. Since we were very much motivated by signal processing, these are mostly signal processing transforms. There's Hartley transform, different cosine transforms, Walsh Hadamard transform, which Georg is a simple version of the FFT filters, uh, some versions of wavelet transforms, that was our target. There are other transforms outside signal processing, that, but there are more, but we haven't done them. Yes? Could you say just a little bit more about search versus machine learning, mm -hmm. how the machine learning works? In fact, you can use, as always, uh, when you do, you can use any machine learning method that you want, or let's say many machine learning methods. What you would do, for example, is the following. Let's pick this example. In this generated library, when you have a size, the library has a built-in degree of freedom, how always to choose the radix and whether to call a base case or further recurse. So at any given point in time when you recurse, there's a decision to be made. What you can do is, you can pick a few sizes. That's one thing we have done, for example. Let's say 16, 256, and 64K. At installation time, you run the search. It will make decisions at each of these decision points found by the search. And then you take these decisions and use them in a decision tree generator. There's, for example, C4.5. That's an algorithm that, that takes data of this kind and generates decision trees. And these decision trees, they look like this. Oh, if n is smaller than 32,000 and larger than 17, then do threading and radix 17. And then, so it's, but these are automatically generated. And then you take these decision trees, you put them into the library at the decision points, and then the library is deterministic. 
okay? And that because evaluating the decision tree is very fast. But there are other methods you can do, so we did more things. Uh, but this, this I like because the decision trees you can actually look at and understand. Okay, more questions? Okay, then, uh, yes, Vaseline. So you showed a lot of formulas. I, I also noticed something that says DF, I mean DFT of size P, where P is prime, then can be decomposed in some yeah. ways. So I'm guessing a lot of these formulas actually don't lead to N log N complexity. No, they do N log N. So the, what you need, you need Kuli Tuki for factor that n factors, and then you need only a prime number uh, one. It's called Raider, mm -hmm. and it decomposes a, a Fourier transform of a prime size into two Fourier transforms of size one smaller. So, so and the uh, that is, are all transforms actually leading to n log n complexity? Yeah, all those that I showed, and the FFT is n log n, and there are statements like it is known that eight n log n does the job. Eight n log n is for all sizes, an upper bound. Complex so, so the search didn't involve also the complexity, it only involved the... No, no, if you throw in all the rules, then you, c because sometimes you have a bit more, of, uh, more ops and it's still faster because the structure is nicer. So you don't go, you don't need to do a cost-based search. You could, but it's nicer to do with runtime if you search. But it's all n log n. Okay, so let me pass on to Georg. He gets already nervous here to get through his part. So thank you, and now uh, we go uh, to a, the practical hands-on session. Thanks. I think this is uh, quite well deserved. Marcus. Thank you. Columbia. Oh, yes. And I'm really honored because as somebody who just starts now to get a bit more into programming languages, I take this as a, as a motivation, <laughs> you know. And we know that a lambda is not always hard like this one, right? So, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Okay, Georg. Okay.